Okay. So welcome to lecture nine of ECE 5312 Modern Digital Communications. So in today's lecture, we're going to continue where we left off in the last lecture and focus on do, completing the calculation for the power efficiency of MR phase shift king or MPSK. Following this, we'll do a comparison of the different types of modulation schemes in terms of their power efficiencies across all that we've seen so far in this course. Okay, starting from all the binary uh, schemes to these very large scale two dimensional modulation schemes. So we must keep in mind when we're calculating power efficiency the same sort of equations that we used again and again in this course, which is the following. So calculate the power efficiency. Power efficiency. That's going to be equal to epsilon p is equal to d min squared divided by e b bar. Where e b bar, so d min squared is equal to what? It's equal to the integral over the symbol period of delta s t squared d t. So um, delta s t squared, delta s is the difference between two symbols that are the most similar in terms of in terms of waveform characteristics that will yield essentially a difference that should be the smallest across all uh, pairings of waveforms. That gives us our d min squared thing, right? The minimum plane distance. So we find the two most similar waveforms, take their difference, take the square of that difference, then take the integral of the square of that difference. That will give us the energy of the difference between those two signals. And then to find e b bar, you need to find out what e s i is, which is equal to zero to t, the integrate across the symbol period of s i of t squared d t. And then from that, you, ha you then calculate what E s bar is by summing, weighing each by the probability that that S i occurs, E s i. And then E b bar is equal to E s bar divided by log base 2 of the signal constellation point. So if you have that and you have this guy, you can then take those and solve for your power efficiency. So this is just to recap what we've been doing so far in this course. We take those two expressions and then we find a ratio in order to find out what the power efficiency is of our signal constellation, of our modulation scheme. So let's get started with MPSK. So what we want is a generic expression for any possible M for this thing. So what happens is calculate the minimum Euclidean distance, d min squared. So let's say we take um, S1 of t, assume that its, its phase is equal to 0, and then S2 of t is the next guy over, and that is um, essentially 2 pi over m. It's the way PSK modulations can work is that your phases, your phases real imaginary plane. So the first signal constellation point after the zeroth phase situation will be 2 pi over m. So if we calculate the d min squared, and there are a number of ways, we can use um, the brute force delta s t squared integrate from 0 to t dt, or we can use this nice expression here where we find the energy of s of t uh, sorry, S1 of t, and the energy of S2 of t, and then subtract away um, two times the correlation between S1 of t and S2 of t, which is uh, represented over here. And what you'll find is that at the end of the day, if you perform this correlation operation, um, what you get is a squared t over 2 times cos of the phase difference, which is 2 pi over m. The energies E1 of uh, e, E1 and E2 
for that, so that's the energy of symbol S1 of t and S2 of t is going to give you um, a squared t over 2. And so when you combine it together to give you d min squared, you get this beautiful expression here. Now, um, if this out uh, by using some simple uh, MPSK representations for m equals 4 and m equals 8. And what we see is that the d min squared does indeed correlate with what we've been solving so far in this course. Now we need to find the average energy um, per bit that's been expended. In order to calculate that, we need to find out what the average, en what the average en symbol energy is. And in order to find that, we need to find out what the So it turns out that since power and energy don't depend on the phase, it's all going to be equal. So we just need to find what is the signal what is the energy for a single single constellation point. And then using that, we can then say, well, that's the average if all of them are equally likely to occur, and then divided by a number of bits that represent each symbol to give us the average bit energy. It turns out that that is equal to, in this case, the average symbol energy, a squared t over 2, and then divided by k bits, if k bits represents one of the m possible symbols in, in the MPSK signal constellation. And it turns out that our power efficiency is equal to this lovely expression here in the box. Given that, let's try generic result. So mpam, which is equal to m amplitude shift keying, or ASK, is equal to this power efficiency representation here, where k is the number of bits representing each possible symbol. Uh, mqam is equal to this expression, 3 factorial times k divided by 2 to the k minus 1. And mpsk is equal to 4k sine squared pi over 2k. Um, there's a blurb up here where I could minus cosine 2 pi divided by m in terms of sine squared. It's just a little bit of mathematical manipulation just to simplify things. Instead of have a subtraction in the middle of the thing, we only have a single function rather than uh, the subtraction of two, two terms. So if we have now these generic expressions, we can make some kind of interesting observations based on the patterns that these guys generate. So let's look at this more clearly. Let's look at, again, our SNR loss for the power efficiency based on a best possible power efficiency of 4, which is achieved by QPSK and BPSK and BPAM. Turns out that as we increase the signal constellation size, right? Excuse me, from one bit per symbol to two bits per symbol to three bits and all the way to six bits per symbol. We look at the MRE PAM or MASK, uh, amplitude shift keying, the MPSK and the MQAM. Notice how we're actually, our, first of all, our power efficiency, is, uh, the SNR loss is getting worse and worse and worse with increasing signal constellation sizes. So, not so good. But notice how with one-dimensional signal constellation representations. So in this case, look at the MPAM or the MASK. It goes from 0 to 4 to 8.45 to 13.27 to 18.4 and so on and so forth um, to 2 point full. It's like the SNR loss is decreasing at a, a horrifically high rate. Now, if we look at PSK, it has a much slower rate uh, in terms of the SNR loss increasing. And then finally, the MQAM, an even lower rate, although we have some ambiguity as to what an 8QAM and a 32QAM would look like. So that would depend on the shape. But 
the big, the good news is, is that qualm, out of, out of all the sort of generic uh, ways of trying to represent information in terms of amplitude or phase or both, it turns out that qualm does the best in terms of as you increase the number of uh, bits that represent each symbol, you actually get sort of the lowest rate of SNR loss with QAM over the other schemes. And that's because it's a two-dimensional scheme that arranges signal constellation points in a very decent uh, and sort of efficient manner, right? as opposed to PAM, which is just one-dimensional, and in order to transmit it like, sort of like the extremes, you have to use a lot of power in order to transmit that far. And uh, PSK is constrained to that circle, but QAM has this nice sort of distribution along the real and imaginary axes. And just, just as a refresher, this is what the SNR loss is equal to, in just in case you forgot, which is the ratio of the power efficiency of QPSK, which is the best possible that you can get, divided by the power efficiency of the modulation scheme you're investigating in log, log 10 log. So, some observations that we can draw based on this SNR loss table. Two-dimensional two modulations are better than one-dimensional modulations, as we can see, in terms of the rate at which the SNR loss increases. And that all modulation schemes here are linear modulations, okay? which is important because simple receiver structures. Okay? So let's talk a little bit more about trade-offs. I mentioned this in the last lecture about um, sort of the um, uh, like you know modulation scheme over another. But let's let's go into more more detail. So um, when we deal with power, if, uh, like you know power efficiency is one. That's one sort of uh, metric, if you will, for choosing one modulation scheme over another. But there's also bandwidth efficiency and receiver complexity. So if you want to design a communication system you better be, be able to not only uh, you know, have a, um, employ a modulation scheme that's power efficient, but your receiver structure better also be uh, simple, robust, and rather inexpensive, and you don't need a supercomputer to run, right? So what happens is that's why we have linear. Linear modulation schemes yield simpler receiver structures, and, and, and cost really does mean anything. It's almost like, how much are you willing to pay for that cell phone? $3,000? No, I would prefer if I can get it for free. So what happens is we trade off, let's say, um, you know, let's say some sort of performance, like um, let's say we choose a nonlinear modulation scheme that might yield a complexity. And linear definitely does very nicely. As for bandwidth efficiency, um, what do I mean by bandwidth efficiency? It's how many bits we can cram in per unit time per hertz of spectrum, the power spectral density. So what do I mean by this? So remember einstein wiener kinchin theorem and its relations and such. The, the, so the power spectral density, if we feed in um, some signal, okay, density multiplied against it, that will give us the output power spectral density, Sy of f. So suppose I feed in some like noise, right, flat noise, into the transfer function of my communication system to produce some sort of output power spectral density, f. What's happening, okay? It's interesting. What happens is, Remember what we were talking about with um, things like the uh, pulse amplitude modulation. And pulse, we use a rectangular pulse. How would that look like spectrally? Rectangular pulse. Oh, it's a sync pulse. So what we have, essentially, is my transfer function. It looks like a sync pulse. Magnitude squared will be a sync squared pulse. Okay, So no negative terms whatsoever. So how would that look like in frequency? this beautiful guy here. How, if we use a rectangular pulse shape, the, uh, you know, to, for your uh, pulse amplitude modulation, you'll get something that looks like this, where you have a non-zero value at 
at, at every t seconds at the origin, oh, and, and sorry, and then at 1 over f, 2 over f, 3 over f, uh, sorry, 1 over t, 2 over t, 3 over t, you get the zero crossings, or nulls. And so what we're very interested in is the rate at which you transmit. So the shorter your period, what should happen? What's the relationship between symbol period and bandwidth? The shorter your symbol period, the bigger your bandwidth is. So the more data you're trying to cram into unit time, the more spectrum you're going to utilize. You're, and so therefore, your bandwidth efficiency becomes very important because in a lot of applications, you might not have a lot of spectrum uh, or frequency or uh, channel bandwidth in order to communicate your information across. So you're going to have to figure out how much information can I cram into that limited bandwidth. Okay? And so a lot of folks use first null as what we call the first null bandwidth to sort of give us a metric of like, you know, given this modulation scheme at this data rate and this pulse shape, we can fit this much information across that channel. Okay? So in a nutshell, you know, these are some of the considerations you're going to need to take to, 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 to look at as an engineer. Power efficiency, uh, bandwidth efficiency, how much information you can cram in per uh, unit amount of spectrum, and com uh, receiver complexity. And so that concludes uh, lecture nine of ECE uh, 5312.